And we're continuing in our walk through the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And grateful even uh, for those in chapel seat. And amen. Thank you so very much uh, for just your coming. But 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to read for your hand verses 1 through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And beginning with verse 1. You can follow on the screen as well. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily, I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory in is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle, not uh, to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covenants or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye need go out of the world. But now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covenant or an idolater or a reller or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one, know not to eat. For what have I to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. I want to preach to your hearts this morning from this subject, no shame in their game. No shame in their game. What do you do when you find out that your best friend is having an affair and cheating on their spouse? What do you do when you are leaving the movies and you see your Sunday school teacher snuggled up with somebody other than their spouse? What do you do, do, brothers and sisters, when it is rumored uh, that the pastor is leaving his wife for another woman? What do we do about open and known sin? And just by the way, that ain't happening here. She's still there. Amen. Raise your hand, sweetie. Let me see your hand. She is happy and satisfied. Amen. And I'm happy and satisfied. But what do you do, brothers and sisters? Do you help in the cover-up or do you help in the clean-up? If you just sweep it under the rug because uh, you don't want to stir up dirt, then you're helping in the cover-up. If you just smirk at it and think it's no big deal because uh, everybody is doing it, and maybe you're doing the same thing yourself, then you're helping in the cover-up. If you just spread it around and, and tell this one and tell that one, oh, girl, you'll never believe what I saw today because everybody loves some juicy rumors, then you're just helping in the cover-up. Even if you keep silent because you don't like to stick your nose in other folks' business and mama taught me to mind my own business, you are helping in the cover-up. See, the truth of the matter is, oftentimes, brothers and sisters, we deal with open and known sin in the wrong way. We sweep, we smirk, we spread, we just keep silent instead of trying to stop the sin. And as a result, our churches have been wrecked by rumors. It has been weakened by whisper. Scandalous sin have silenced the church voice and sapped the church of her drawing power. Sinners are so quick to say, why go to church when there are more hypocrites in the church than there are in the world? 
And so that's why this morning, Brown, I want to share with you this morning that in order to protect the integrity of the church and to promote growth in sin and saints, we must biblically deal with open and known sin. The reputation of the church, the integrity of the church is not just the preacher's responsibility. It's all of our responsibility. And if we're going to protect the integrity of the church, if we're going to be involved in the growing of other believers, we must biblically deal with sin in the church. And so in our text this morning, Brian, I want us to discover the right way to deal with open and known sin. Uh, Paul is going to give us uh, what it is and how it is that we ought to deal and discipline those that are caught up in sin. He's going to talk about our attitude toward the sin, our actions toward the sinner, and then our agreement with the saint. In Acts chapter 5, uh, Paul finds himself talking about going from the boiling pot into the frying pan. He have just dealt four chapters dealing with church unity, and now he's going to get into this whole issue for the next few chapters about sex and its place in marriage and in the church family. And so today he's dealing with immorality, sexual immorality. The facts of the situation is us following. Uh, Paul said it is reported commonly that there is fornication such as not even found among heathen folks. Y'all got stuff going on in the church, he said, tougher than what they got going on on the outside. And that is this fella has been sleeping with his father's wife. And so he is having an adulterous relationship, an affair with his stepmother. No, this ain't Lifetime movies, y'all. This ain't Bobby O.J. Morning Show, but this is being publicized right from the church. It was open and known, and, and this is why I know that uh, the Corinthian church was a Baptist church because Paul said it is reported commonly. In other words, there's a lot of talk going on, and oftentimes there's talk going on, but we're talking in the wrong way. Instead of talking to folks, we're talking about folks. Instead of talking folks up, we're talking folks down, and Paul said we got to deal with this situation. Now, just for the record, somebody might be wondering, well, what's wrong with that? If I'm doing that all day today, Leviticus chapter 18 had clearly prohibited this kind of relationship. Matter of fact, it said that you ought not have any kind of sexual relation with kin folks, whether it is blood kin, step kin, or in law. Look, uh, the uncovered nakedness is just another way of saying don't sleep with folks that you ain't married to. Sex and marriage. Sex has been designed, designed for marriage. And any time we take it outside of marriage, y'all, it becomes destructive. I heard this analogy years ago, and I just give it again. I might give it again uh, later on. But look, uh, think of fire in a fireplace. Fire in a fireplace will give warmth to the entire house. Now, you can take that same fire and put it on the living room flow in front of the fireplace and guess what it's going to do it's going to burn the house down why because it was designed in the fireplace and when it is used where it is designed to be burned it gives warmth but when you take it out of what it was designed for and just put it anywhere else it'll burn the house down and that is what is happening when we take sex and we take it outside of the confinement of marriage. And, and so this brother's having an affair with his stepmother. And Paul says, number one, look at what our attitude about the sin ought to be. Our attitude about the sin. Paul said, you're puffed up. You're arrogant to the point where you are glorying, verse 6, in what is going on. You see, the church was actually promoting the sin because of their indifference to the sin and their pride and their boasting, their glorying about the sin. To some folks, it was no big deal. To others, it was kind of cute. And Paul said, you are puffed up, verse 2, when you should have been what? You're rather mourning for what is going on. And that's the attitude that we ought to have, brothers and sisters. We ought to be mourning. It ought to sadden us. 
when there is open sin in the church, uh, it is occurring in the church, we should be saddened. Mourning ought to be to sin. You, you, you see, Satan is smart, y'all. And, 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 and he's, a clever, he's a clever devil, y'all. Uh, the trick of the devil is to get us to look at sin. And if he can get us to look at sin long enough, he'll get us to laugh at the sin. And when we start laughing at the sin, we'll lessen the consequences of the sin. And then we'll find ourselves willing to live with the sin. Don't, don't, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. But how many looked at sin this week? You ain't got to raise your hand. But look, if you watch TV, you probably looked at some sin. Because the last time I checked, ABC, NBC, Lifetime, in, uh, some of y'all got that high price stuff, Cinemax and HBO. Ain't holy stuff going on there. Think about it. Think about it. They take off housewives. And they really weren't housewives. But they done replaced them with mistresses and with maids that's doing everything but cleaning the house. We look at the sin and then we laugh at the sin. Somebody sent us a dirty email. Oh, we think it's so cute. We forward it on to everybody else. Can y'all take my name out of y'all little loop? Did y'all send everything to? Did y'all send every text message to? Because we send it all out laughing at it, and then we lessen the consequences. We think it's no big deal. Even to the point that we're comfortable to live with it. Let it be a part. Uh, I was talking to Valerie. Uh, the sad thing is we have created a culture of immorality where it seemed like any and everything is okay to be done right within the church. And yet Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 1, he said, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, it's crying time, y'all. Our attitude about the sin ought to be mourning, but not only our attitude about the sin, what should our actions toward sinner be the person that is doing the wrong how should, can we do that well number one we ought to confront them we ought to confront them Matthew chapter 18 verse 15 moreover if thy brother shall trespass against thee go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone if he shall hear thee thou hast gained thy brother confront them oftentimes we look the other way we, we don't just I simply tell somebody you're wrong that's not right you ought not do it. Jesus said, confront them. And obviously, after confronting them, brothers and sisters, the second thing we ought to do is we ought to correct them. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. When you see immorality going on, you ought to correct them. You ought to come along and, and say, well, you know what? Here's what the word says. Here's what the Bible says. And let, let's get in the Bible. Matter, matter of fact, I'll intercede on your behalf. I'll pray for you and pray with you. I'll walk you through this journey. I'll ask you the tough questions and, and I'll hold you accountable and you hold me accountable. It's about correcting them. Now, if confronting them and correcting them doesn't help, the third action ought to be we cut ties with them. And with this fella in the text, Paul said, y'all are wrong, first of all, for not confronting him. I'm not even there. And Paul said, I've already cast judgment. You didn't even try to correct him. And Paul said, he seemed like he's so stubborn in his way, you ought to cut ties with him. Cut ties with him. That's, that's why he says, verse 5, you ought to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Well, that sounds harsh. But here's what Paul is saying. You ought to pray for their punishment. You ought to pray for their punishment. You ought to pray that they feel the consequences of their action. You ought to pray that they hit rock bottom. You ought to pray that somehow uh, they will experience so much pain until they will want to repent and get right with God. He said you ought to pray for their punishment. Uh, not, not only that, but verse 11, the uh, last part of this, Paul said, look, I wrote you one letter, and I told you all not to uh, hang with folks, not to even eat a happy meal with folks. He said, I wasn't talking about folks in the world. 
He said, you can't get around those kind of folks. You're going to always be working with folks on the job and living next door to folks and in the community. But Paul said, when I'm talking about cutting ties, I'm talking about folks in the church house. I'm talking about folks that are just sitting beside uh, Sunday after Sunday. If any of those individuals are, are caught up in immorality, fornication, if they're coveting it, if they are, are worshiping other idols, if, if they are green with envy, if they are cursing and, and are drunk, and if they're stealing things from under the table, Paul said, don't even eat with such a one. Don't even hang with them. Now, the whole point in, in, in cutting ties with them is so that you can shame them into doing the right thing. That's why Paul says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 14 and, and 15, if any man will be not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. What is our action toward the sinner? Confront them. Young folks, if you know somebody is sexting, if you know somebody is caught up in things even on Facebook that they ought not be doing, confront them, correct them. And if it doesn't work, then we cut ties with them. We separate ourselves in hopes that it will lead to reconciliation and to righteousness. No folks that are caught up in open sin Immorality, no, they shouldn't be teaching Sunday school. They shouldn't be preaching in the pulpit. They shouldn't be singing in the choir and holding leadership position. Brothers and sisters, when we have become so bold, when we have become so brazen until we are flaunting our stuff and it's, hey, I do my own thing, somebody need to do the right thing toward them. And we need to confront them, correct them, if need to cut ties with them. Well, what should be our agreement then with the saints? What is our agreement with the saints? Brothers and sisters, simply this. We need to hold each other accountable and hold each other to a higher standard. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. As iron sharpens iron, so does a man sharpen the countenance of his friend. And so we ought to hold each other to a higher standard. Uh, Y'all, look, look, what, what Paul is saying here is we ought not condone one another in our sin. We ought not help one another in their sin. But we ought to be in agreement that says that, hey, I'm going to hold and, and help you to live and do all that God have called you to do. You see, a friend that will help you do wrong is not a friend at all. A friend that will let you do wrong is not a friend at all. This, this is not friendship. You tell your mama you spend a night with me, and that way you can go do what you want to do. And then the next night I'm going to tell my mama I'm spending a night with you, and then that way I can go do. No, that ain't friendship. That is a partnership from hell that is leading you down a road of destruction. And so what Paul is saying is that we ought to have an agreement with one another. Because here's the thing, brothers and sisters, if I mess up, it's just not my business. It's the church business. And it ultimately becomes God's business. And it's serious offense when we allow sin to continue and to bring shame to the Lord's name. And so, Brown, it's time out for playing games. It's time out uh, for us just allowing any and everything to go. And what Paul is saying here is, let's remove the leaven out of the house. Let's remove the leaven out of the house. That's what he said. Don't you know that a little leaven, leaven is a whole lump. Leaven is yeast. It was a symbol of sin in the Bible because you take yeast, put it in dough. Guess what it's going to do? It's going to make that dough rise. And Paul is saying it only takes just a little sin in the church. It's only take just somebody over here and everybody know about it, nobody doing anything about it. And before you know it, it'll sweep across the whole church. And so in the Old Testament, they had the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover when they got every bit of yeast out of the house because God said it's time to clean up. And old brothers and sisters, it's time even in the Lord's house that we remove the leaven out of the house. But not only remove the leaven out of the house, but let's rebuke with love. 
Let's rebuke with love. It's time now for grinning at and cheesing in folks' faith. And we know that life is tore up from the flow up. And we're not saying anything about it. We ought to rebuke with love. We ought to let somebody know there is a better way. God's way is the best way. Rebuke with love. And then, y'all, let's raise the standard. Let's raise the standard. Let, let's raise the standard. Y'all, look, look I, I'm just crazy enough to believe that we can raise the standard. That we don't have to have the low standards of the world. That we don't have to live like the world. But we can raise the standard. Oh, how shameful it is. Time some young girl turned 13, 14 years old. We put them on birth control because we don't want anything brought back home. How sad it is. What we have just done is lower up the stem. We're letting them know you can do what you want to do because we don't trust you at all. But let's raise the stem and say God has made you special, young lady. He has made you precious and you ought to keep your body. It goes for the boys as well. Until you get Get married. Let's raise the standard. I think we can still have where uh, there are virgins that will get married. We ought to institute virtue back into this thing. Let's raise the standard. And so we want to be a holy church, a church of righteousness, a church of integrity. And so how shameful it is, brothers and sisters, that in a church house today, there is no shame in the game. No shame in game funny and, 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 and folks endorse homosexuality and lesbianism. No shame in the game. Preachers standing up to preach the word of God and yet they have girlfriend over here, girlfriend over there, baby over there. No shame in the game. Have folks that we know are drunks that yet sit on leadership position. No shame in the game. Folks shacking at, and we still let them stand on the door and sing in the choir. And yet they're not married to each other. No shame in the game. God is saying it's time out, y'all. It's time that we raise the standard. At. And so I don't know about y'all, but I want Brown to be a bold church. I want Brown to be a brave church. But I want Brown to be a believable church. I want Brown to be a righteous church, a, a church of integrity. And if we're going to be bold, brave, and believable, let me give you three B's and I, I let you go. If we're going to be bold and believable, y'all, first of all, we need the Bible. We need the Bible because, because if you're going to handle temptation you you need the, the bible the word of god psalms 119 verse 9 how can a young man clean up his ways but by taking heed to the word of god he said with my whole heart have i sought thee oh let me not wander from thy commandment he said thy word have i hid in my heart that i might not sin against thee y'all we need to get back in the bible the b-i-b-l-e yes that Another B, 
y'all, we need boundaries. We need boundaries. We need boundaries. There are some things Christians ought not look at. There are some shows Christians ought not watch. There are some stuff that we ought not listen to. There are some places that we ought not go. And we ought to set some boundaries for ourselves. You know your weakness. You know your issue. You know what you're struggling with. Stop letting Satan treat you like a yo-yo. But you ought to set some boundaries. And when somebody call you and say, let's go to happy hour, you ought to set some boundaries and say, no, no, my happy hour is Sunday morning. 45. Why don't you come and go with me? We can get a set up with the Holy Ghost. We can get a high and in the morning we are still remember it. You ought to set some boundaries and said I can't go everywhere. I can't do everything. I want to be satisfied, sanctified in Jesus Christ. Set some boundaries. Set some boundaries. Boundaries. Set some boundaries. But not only the Bible, not only boundaries, but another B we need. We need some buddies. We need some buddies. We need some buddies. Spirit feel buddies. Church going buddies. Jesus knowing buddies. Bible reading buddies. We need some buddies that will tell us the truth. Buddies that will ask us the hard question. But as they will go down on their knees and have a talk with the law, we need some buddies, yeah, that will help us to do the right thing. But why, preacher? Why do you want to be believable? Because what Paul said in the text, he said, Christ is our Passover lamb. Christ is our Passover lamb. When we were too wicked to die. stay. Jesus shed in his blood. He looked beyond our faults. He supplied our every need. And one Friday, he nailed our sins. One Friday, he hung, bled, and died for all of our immorality. Went down in the grave. But early, early, Sunday morning, Jesus, he for us to keep on sleeping around. He's put too much in us for us to keep on watching porn. He's put too much in us for us to keep on passing dirty emails. He's put too much in us. Yeah! And so if you're married, be true to your spouse. If you're married, be true to your spouse. If you're married, be true to your spouse. If you're married, true to your spouse. Drink water out of your own dipper and don't share your dipper with somebody else. If you're married, when you leave work, go home. If you're married, get off of Facebook. If you're married, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Nourish her. Cherish her. Make her happiness. Your number one problem attack. Let her satisfy you at all times. If you're married, respect your husband. Have the law of kindness in your tongue. Respect your husband. Married folks, be true to your spouse. Be true to your spouse. Be true to your spouse. But then single folks, live abstinent. Single folks, live abstinent. Single folks, Live with abstinence. Look, it ain't this try it by a thing. Stop the shacking. If he can't put a ring on your finger, if he can't put papers on you, get your own place. Move back home if you got to. But single folks, live with abstinence. Young folks, young folks, remain a virgin. Virgin ain't a dirty word. Remain true to God. Wait for the Lord to send you.
you somebody. Stop the sexting. Stop the pictures. Stop the tweets. Get right with God. If you've already messed up, recommit yourself. He can forgive. He can make you clean. Yeah. 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 No shame. No shame. Shame on us. When you have a church, a family function, when you let somebody bring somebody that ain't their wife. Shame on us. If they came in town to visit you, they ain't married. Don't let them shack up in your house. Send them to the hotel. But shame on us if we allow things to go on and not make it right and help in the cleanup and not be a part of the cover-up.